Um, so thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming and attending this evening. And for those of you that are watching afterwards, since this talk will be recorded. And as we were just saying, this is one of the great things about the virtual platform is you can, you know, reach so many more people that may not have otherwise been able to participate. So this is great. And so thank you very much. And thank you to the Lunar and Planetary Institute for organizing these sessions and continuing um, to bring this exciting science and mission work um, out to folks even during the era of COVID. So this is, this is really great. Um, I'm going to talk about the Viper mission. Um, we're going to be roving, roaming on the moon. Um, my name is Jennifer Heldman. I'm, at, I'm with the NASA Ames Research Center um, in California. And I wanted to give a special thanks before I started to Dr. Anthony Colapri. He's the Viper Project scientist and the leader of this, um, this scientific investigation that we're about to do. And he's responsible for a lot of these slides. And I think that's just emblematic of the attitude on this mission, which is share and share alike and collaborate. Because as we'll see, as I explain this mission to you, there are so many different components that need to work together in order to make this mission work, because this is a mission unlike any we've ever done before. Um, so there's so many moving parts, and it's a really great team to work on because everyone is just in it to make this mission work and doing whatever needs to be done um, to make that happen. So it's a really great um, project to be on and a great team. So what are we doing here? First of all, VIPER is an acronym because this is NASA and we love acronyms. Um, so VIPER stands for the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. So the background for VIPER, just very briefly, because I don't have enough time, I could give a whole other talk on this, um, is looking at water on the moon. And so not that long ago, I mean, even when I was in school, you know, in college um, and before, we learned, you know, the moon is bone dry, there's no water on the moon, thank you very much, moving right along. And then we've continued to send missions and make measurements of the moon, and there was some tantalizing data that made us think, wait a minute, actually, wait, maybe there is some water on the moon. And so really in the past decade, we have built this fascinating new story about water on the moon and a hydrologic cycle on the moon, which we would have never even contemplated even 10 years ago. So everything from surface frost to potentially buried blocks of ice, it seems like there's water all over the place, but we don't know the details. Its nature and its distribution are very uncertain. So in order to really understand this, the next step is to get on the ground, to get on the surface of the moon and move around and make measurements and try and understand, you know, where is this water and what is it like? So that's what we're doing with Viper. Um, and Viper is, is unique. Viper is really doing exploration science. So we will learn a lot scientifically about water on the moon. You know, we're gonna try and understand, you know, where is it? What is it like? What else is there? How did it get there? Is it moving around? All these scientific questions. But we also want to apply that and use and have applied science and use that potentially as a resource for when we send future missions. Um, so this is, this is why we're so interested in going to the poles of the moon, which is where Viper will be targeted. So the moon is, has special conditions. So when you look up at the moon, when you see it in the night sky, you look near the poles of the moon. And I have a moon here. So the moon, here's my globe. The moon has what we call a very low obliquity or a low tilt. This is, you know, if it's spinning, this is a high tilt, but the moon is pretty much up and down in the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic is the plane that all the planets basically go around the sun. So the moon is not tilted very much. It's pretty much straight up and down. And so as the moon rotates, the sun is coming in and it comes in at the poles at a very low angle, right? So it's kind of just skimming across the top of the poles. And there's topography at the poles. There's a lot of impact craters, like you can see in this picture that's on your screen. Topography or craters or other features that create permanently shadowed regions near the North Pole and the South Pole of the Moon. So this, what this means, what does permanently shadowed region means? This means there are places on the Moon that literally have not seen sunlight in billions of years. Like no sunlight can get in there because that sunlight's coming in and it's just skimming across the top of those depressions. So it's super, super dark, and that means it's super, super cold. And so that cold condition is perfect for trapping ices, and that's what we're interested in. So we figured out, okay, you go to the poles of the moon, you've got these permanently shadowed regions, they're really, really cold, and couple that with the data that we've been seeing in the past 10 years or so, um, and even before that, if you go back and like, oh wait, maybe there's ice in those permanently shadowed regions. 
And the story gets a little more complicated. Now we're finding ice in other places too, which, which I'll also tell you about. So this is one of the motivators, these conditions at the, at the polar regions of the moon um, for when NASA sends astronauts back. NASA is embarking on what's called the Artemis program, which is to, to send astronauts forward to the moon. The Apollo astronauts um, mostly went to equatorial regions um, for very good reasons and did a lot of science and exploration. And now when we send humans through Artemis, we're looking at going to the south polar region. Part of the region, part of the reason for that, one of the motivating motivating factors is the sunlight. So I'll show you, you know, just like the sunlight's coming in at a low angle. So if you're on a high point, you get a lot of sun for a long period of time. And that's really good for power reasons. That's really good for maintaining a thermal environment. So following the light and also for operations, right? If you have astronauts on the surface, it's sunlit, you can see what you're doing. So the sunlight really drives us to the poles, as well as the proximity to these potential ice reservoirs. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about ISRU, in situ resource utilization. So that is basically using resources that are already there on the moon, living off the land. And it turns out that water ice is a very valuable resource potentially. And so we need, that's why we need Viper, is we need to go and figure out, you know, in order to use resources in space, we need to know their location, where they are, the quantity, how much of it is there, uh, the distribution, where is it? Is it all over? Is it patchy? Where do you need to go? And the extractability, like can you and how do you actually get it out of the ground and actually use it? So this is why Viper is really exciting because it's really looking at, you know, the scientific questions behind water ice and other volatiles on the moon and also for the applied science for enabling ISRU, for helping us get astronauts back, and this way having a sustained human presence on the lunar surface. So that's one of the things that I really like about Viper is it's kind of this, um, all these worlds coming together um, in this really nice way. And that's what this little Venn diagram shows, what we've been talking about, the intersection of science questions, of exploration that's getting the humans back, and then also commerce, because we're talking about you know, ices and volatiles being resources that could potentially be used. So where we are with Viper is we need to understand these very fundamental questions you know, regarding these resources. What are they, where are they, and how much? And so that's what Viper is going to start to do for us. So as I said, we, we're trying to figure out you know, where these things are. Why do we even think that there's water there? Well, I don't have time to go through the whole scientific history, but here's just some images of some of the data that we get. Um, you can see this nicely colored picture of the moon. It's showing different areas of hydration that we've been measuring from orbit, from remote sensing. So we have orbiters that are going around the moon right now, looking down and making measurements. Um, also on the bottom, you see the nice pretty colors. You're looking, that's a map of the lunar surface. And so basically where the colors are, you're looking at more water um, across the lunar surface in different areas from remote sensing. So we can get some information um, from that type of data. We've had really one ground truth, um, and that was the LCROSS mission, the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. Um, I like that mission because I worked on it. Um, and that's the squiggly lines that you see on the chart. I just, scientists love squiggly lines, so I had to throw at least one in. Um, but uh, so basically what LCROSS did, here's a model of LCROSS. And so this launched to the moon. And then we put this little shepherding spacecraft on the end of this is the upper stage of the launch vehicle, which basically held all the fuel. And then we popped off this little shepherding spacecraft. It had nine instruments on it so it could observe the moon. And then we, on purpose, impacted this part, which was a big empty metal can by the time it got to the moon, hit this into Cabeus Crater, which is a very, one of these permanently shadowed regions on the moon. Hit the, hit the moon, kicked up a big plume of dust and debris, and then took this little shepherding spacecraft and flew right through that plume to measure it. And lo and behold, um, there was water there, and more than we might have even thought. And so that's what these squiggly lines are telling you. It's kind of like matching the fingerprints. So the red line is the data, what we measured with that little shepherding spacecraft from one of our instruments. And then it's basically like fingerprint matching, right? Look at the blue line, that's water. And say, oh, there's a dip here and there's a dip there. And that's in a very simplified way how we figure out, one of the ways we figure out that there's water. And then we had eight other instruments that also were helping to corroborate that. So we have all these different lines of evidence that, you know, there's some water at the moon, but we really have to characterize it better. 
So how, what are we going to do? How are we going to go about this? Well, since we're talking about resources, um, there's a few ways you can do it, right? If you want to find a resource that you want to use and you want to live off the land. Um, I love this picture. Um, luck, just go out and just randomly look for it and maybe you'll get lucky. Um, you could do that, but it's, um, it's difficult to do that on the moon and to get there and it's expensive. So what we're doing is applied science and we're going to characterize an area um, where we think the resources are and we're really relying on terrestrial or earth-based models because people have been mining and looking for resources on earth for a hundred years or more. Um, so what terrestrial mining companies do is they develop what are called mineral models um, to evaluate the potential of a site for having whatever it is that resource that you're trying to look for. So what we're doing with Viper, um, we're looking at theoretical models of water placement and retention, basically how the water would get there and how it would stay there. And so we want to understand these processes because that gives us the ability to predict where those resources will be. If we can understand how the water got there um, and why is it still there, we can predict in other locations where we don't necessarily have a drill hole to confirm. Um, we have this predictive capability to figure out, you know, where's the resource and, and how much of it is there. So this is how we do it on Earth, um, and this is how we're, we're planning to do it on the moon, too. So this is the approach um, that we're taking within the Viper project um, and some additional resource acti or, uh, research activities that we're doing. Basically, I mean, you take the sum total of all of the data you have um, about this region and put it all together to understand the context and to understand where you'd have water, why you'd have it there, and why is it still there. Um, so this is just an example. These are all different maps of all different types of data that are listed in the bottom corner of what we have on the moon. And we stack them all up. And then we, we try to understand what each of these different data sets is telling us about the potential for water on the moon. And we've teamed up with the USGS. Um, Josh Coyne is our, our, our lead for that from the USGS because this is what the USGS does. Um, this is what their division does, is making these mineral potential models and pulling together data sets and doing the geostatistical analysis to figure out, okay, go here, don't go here, drill here, oh, I think it's over here. Um, so it's a really interesting application of a lot of terrestrial work that's now being applied um, to the moon. So that's exciting. So for Viper, what are we doing? Well, Viper is a rover. So we know that it's very important that you can move around on the lunar surface. You've got to have mobility. We can't just go to one place and hope we get lucky, right? We have to move around and we have to map out the ice and figure out where it is. So we have this beautiful rover. I'll give you some more specs on it in a minute, which is very brief for you right now. Some of the components, um, there's a camera mast um, so you can have vision and communication, see where you're going and be able to relay data back to us on Earth. Um, we have a drill so that we can get into the ground, into the subsurface, so we'll drill down the meter. Um, there are solar arrays for power, so those are on, on the sides. Um, we reject the heat out of the top um, for thermal controls. And then there's a few instruments that we're using to map out this ice, and I'll tell you a little more about them, but here's where they're mounted. There's a neutron spectrometer, a near-infrared spectrometer, and then this mass spectrometer that's down here. So just to give you a sense of scale, it's kind of like a golf cart, uh, two and a half meters or so. Um, and this is just giving you sort of CAD drawings of the rover from different angles. But the way that I really like seeing it put in context is next to other rovers that we've sent, particularly to Mars and also to the moon. Um, so here are some of the, on the top line, some of the other um, Mars rovers that have been sent um, for scale. And then on the bottom, some of the lunar rovers, you can see on an astronaut, a person for scale. And then there's Viper. So you can see, just sort of give you a sense for how big um, this rover is. Okay, so here's some of the specs. I just put this in here for, uh, for posterity so that folks can refer back to this if you wanted more details. Um, essentially, the mission duration is on the order of 90 Earth days, so several lunar days worth of data. And I'll, I'll tell you how we're able to do that using a, a solar powered rover. I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the instruments, those three spectrometers and the drill. Um, the communications is direct to Earth, so that's how we're, we're doing COM. Uh, people always like the top speed. How fast did your rover go? Are you like cruising across the lunar surface? Top speed is half a mile per hour. <laughs> so, and um, prospecting speed is about 10 centimeters per second. 
And there's a reason for that. It's because the neutron spectrometer needs to get good statistics when it's collecting data to map out the subsurface um, hydrogen. So we, we limit it at, at, that, uh, at that speed. So the payload, just very briefly, again, I'm not gonna go through all the specs, but it's here for your reference if you would like. Um, just some of the highlights. Um, the neutron spectrometer system, the NSS, uh, that's being built um, from NASA Ames Research Center. So this is a neutron spectrometer, and this is a really great instrument because what it does, it's mounted on the rover, but it's sensitive to the upper about meter or so on the subsurface, and it can map hydrogen, which is a proxy for water because water is H2O. So as we're driving along, we're actually measuring how much is in the subsurface without having to drill yet. So you can see how much hydrogen is there. So it's a very clever way of being able to get sort of a bulk volumetric hydrogen content while you're, while you're driving. Um, we also have a near-infrared volatile spectrometer system um, that's also being built um, and run out of NASA Ames Research Center in California. So near-infrared is a part of the spectrum where you have very diagnostic water bands. You can see water ice in the near-infrared. Some of that was that Elcrest data that I, I showed you before. You can see these dips, which, you know, we love our squiggly lines as scientists, but these are really important squiggly lines because um, that tells us that there's water. So, Nervous will also be on while we're driving and it's looking at the lunar surface. So it will be able to see volatiles, um, including water and other volatiles as well, OH, CO2, et cetera. It can tell us the mineralogy that we're driving across. Um, surface morphologies, it can also measure the temperature. That's really important. So you need to know the temperature so you can figure out, is it cold enough for those volatiles to be there? And does this all make sense? So Nervous is a very important instrument. And also it will look at uh, the drill cuttings that come up from the drill. So when these pieces from the subsurface come up or dumped on the surface, Nervous will look at them, and that way we'll be able to measure in the near infrared the subsurface samples, which is really clever, because now we can start to map out the water ice as a function of depth, which is cool. Um, ditto for MSOLO, the Mass Spectrometer Observing Lunar Observations. This is being led out of NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, and this is a mass spectrometer which is just a fancy way to say that it can detect volatiles or, or the gas phase that's released. So as the drill goes down um, and it brings samples up to the surface, both Nervous and MSOLO are looking at those samples that have been brought up, dumped on the surface, looking at those cuttings, and as ice is sublimated away, the mass spectrometer is measuring that. So you can tell what volatiles were sequestered at different depths um, um, in the subsurface. And we're looking at about 10 centimeter bites. We'll drill down 10 centimeters, measure. Drill down 10 centimeters, measure. Um, so we'll get a stratigraphy of what ices are down there. And then of course, the drill itself, um, the Trident drill. Um, this is being led and run out of Honeybee Robotics, um, also in California. So it's a one meter drill, and this is how we get those ground truths in the subsurface, the subsurface um, sampling. So how are we getting to the moon? I should mention um, another interesting thing about Viper is how we're actually going to get there. And this is using a new NASA program called CLPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, where essentially um, NASA is just contracting out to commercial companies and saying, give us a flight to the moon and we'll pay you. It's like, you know, FedEx to the moon, right? So Astrobotic um, out of Pennsylvania is going to be delivering the Viper rover to the lunar surface aboard their Griffin lander. And so here's a nice um, visual of here's the lander on the lunar surface, and then there's the Viper rover going down the ramp and about to start its mission. So this is also a really cool thing about the Viper mission is using the CLPS mechanism, which can help hopefully provide more rapid and frequent uh, access to lunar surface at lower cost. So, okay, great. So we get, you know, Astrobotic gets us to the surface, we rove off, we do our checkouts, we rove off, we're ready to start measuring. Well, what are we doing? We have to be able to measure the volatiles at human scales, right? Because part of the purpose of Viper is the application of this information for future human exploration and using the ice as a resource for sustained human presence on the moon. So how are we gonna do that? Um, we wanna look across a broad area, um, but you can't just drill everywhere, right? That's true on Earth and it's true on the moon. It would be a prohibitive number of drill sites that you would have to do. So we, we can't just drill. Um, we are going to make measurements while we're driving with those instruments.
instruments I just described. Um, but we're only seeing the surface with Nervous and even with them solo if you're just driving. And the neutron data is not necessarily definitive. There's some modeling that has to go into the um, assumptions you have to make to understand the vertical distribution of that hydrogen that it measures. So the trick is to use the drill strategically and use these boreholes to tie down the neutron measurements um, by constraining the vertical profile, right? So we're gonna, as we're driving, we're continuing to take measurements with those spectrometers. And then at predetermined and interesting spots, and also we can change it during the mission, which we'll talk about, um, you drill and you ground truth so that you can make sure you understand that neutron data and the data from the other instruments that are coming back. And that builds up your understanding of what's going on on the moon and it builds up your predictive capabilities. So it's a really clever and smart way to be able to monitor while you're driving, but do strategic tie points to ground truth your data using that drill. And another really important part of the mission, which I can give a whole nother talk on another day, um, is the real-time operations aspect of this. Real-time data analysis allows for smart sampling. So we're only at the moon, right? You can see it, um, you know, look up in the night sky. So we can have pretty rapid communication between the Earth and the moon. So the cool thing is that Viper will be sending us back this data basically in real time. We'll be getting it back in the Mission Science Center and we'll be looking at it and we'll be making decisions based on what we see um, for areas in the science stations, which I'll show you. So we can react to the data that we're getting back. It's very different from how a Mars mission is operated, for example, because Mars is further away. You know, it takes, it takes more time for a signal to go from the Earth to Mars and then from Mars and back to the Earth. So you can't really do the same type of tactical uh, planning and real-time operations that you can do on the moon. So this was, hasn't been done for a robotic mission. It's really, um, Apollo did this with a, you know, science backroom and, and people interacting in real time. So this is a, this is a new thing for, you know, modern planetary exploration um, robotic. Um, and so that's a very exciting, exciting aspect of the mission. And so over here, I'm just showing um, on this plot, this is, we've done um, field testing. So it's always a good idea, I think, um, to test your instruments and your data analysis and your operations in a low cost, low risk environment. So this is an example from a few years ago. We did the Mojave Volatiles Prospector campaign, the MVP, and we took the Nervous and the NSS, which are two of the Viper instruments, and mounted them on a rover, and we drove them in the Mojave Desert. We had a science team back at NASA Ames um, so that we could understand what is, what is the instruments telling us about the water that's in the Mojave, which Mojave's pretty dry and the moon's pretty dry, so we're, they were, we're looking at similar um, water abundances. Um, how do we analyze the data? What kind of software do we need? What kind of analysis tools do we need? And try and work this all out ahead of time and test it in an Earth environment before we actually send it to the moon. Because then by the time we get to the moon, we're ready. We know what we're doing. So here's just a nice graphic that, that really beautifully shows how Viper is monitoring what's going on on the lunar surface and subsurface. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but Viper is driving across, you know, we're just continually collecting data. And so if you start over on the left-hand side, you know, you've got surface temperature in yellow, it's pretty high, neutrons are pretty high, oh, water OH band strength, that's the near infrared, it's pretty low. But then, oh, look what happens when we cover, you know, we start driving over some frost or some OH, or, you know, there's some water signature that we drive over on the surface and in the subsurface too. And all of a sudden, oh, the surface temperature goes down as we're driving, because now we're going over ice. And look, the water band strength starts going up because we just drew over ice. Um, and the neutrons start going down because that's the signature you expect when you've got ice underground. So these are the types of things that we are going to be looking at um, on the science team to interpret and understand what the distribution of the ice is um, as we're actually roving. So that's pretty cool. Um, just an idea for how the phases go. Um, this is how the mission um, schedule at a very high level, how it looks. Um, as I mentioned, Astrobotic is delivering the Viper rover to the moon. Um, so their mission lasts for the first, you know, five days to a week or so. Um, so we launch, we get in lunar transfer, we get in lunar orbit, descent, landing, checkout, rate, and then we egress to the lunar surface. Once we're on the lunar surface, that's when we start our surface operations. Um, the next slide, I'll show you some more detail about what that actually looks like. Um, we have sort of different phases within the operations. Um, traverse legs, that's when we're driving, right? That's when we can see the Earth, 
the, the rover can see the Earth and the sun, except when we purposely go into permanent shadow. Um, we also have hibernation times. So this is when we are not in view of the Earth, um, but we can see the sun and we can, we can withstand um, shorter periods of sun shadow, less than 72 hours. Because remember, it's a solar powered mission, so we need solar power, but there are some batteries to help us um, stay alive when you're in shadow because it's, it's a very tricky problem. I'll show you some of the site selection work uh, because you're at the lunar poles, right? And you've got the low sun angle. And so the shadows change dramatically and quickly. And so it's a, it's a very tricky issue to plan your traverses and to plan your hibernation to make sure you're at the place you need to be when you need to be there so you don't get stuck um, in shadow for too long. So for a traverse plan, just as an example, um, we have a couple different uh, different things that we do. So we have something that we call rails drive or driving on the rails. That's like basically there's a pre-planned path and the rover just goes. It's still collecting data the whole time, but we're going, we're driving on purpose to a, a science station that is of interest for various scientific reasons. Um, and then we do rails driving again and go to the next science station and you drive on the rails to the next science station. And then when you need to, you go to what we call a safe haven. So this is sort of an area where you have a lot of light, um, where you can withstand those times when we're not, for example, in direct calm with the earth. Um, within a science station, there are activities that happen there as well. So this is, um, we have three drill sites that were allowed within a science station. And so usually drill sites one and two are predetermined. We do this, you know, a priori with the data that we have. And then for drill site three, we take the data that has been coming in from Viper. This is where that real-time operations comes into play. And we strategically choose the site that we want to do that third drill site at to really nail down those tie points, those ground truths. And we can also, you know, kind of manipulate the path that we drive within the science station as well to get to that drill point in order to maximize the science return and maximize the understanding that we're getting from the instruments while we're moving and prospecting um, so that we can create the highest fidelity mineral resource potential maps for ice that we possibly can. So those are sort of the big um, activities for, for science. And I mentioned um, landing sites is a very, very complicated, tricky um, issue just because of the complexity of, of the conditions near the lunar poles. Viper has not chosen a final landing site yet, that has not happened yet, but we have been looking at options to make sure that there are multiple places that meet all the requirements that we have. And spoiler, there are, so that's good. Um, so what do we need at the landing site for Viper? Well, we need somewhere where we think there's gonna be subsurface volatiles and ices, so that's number one. Number two, we need reasonable terrain for landing and traverse, right? So the slopes can't be too steep. You don't wanna land like on a, you know, a sharp cliff, something like that. We need somewhere where we can drive and get to our different places. Um, we need direct view to earth for communications and we need sunlight for power. So we have to merge all of those together um, to end up in the middle of this Venn diagram um, to cover all of those high level requirements. Um, I'm not gonna read all the words on this slide, but suffice it to say that temperature is a pretty important factor. Um, we're trying to figure out, you know, where do we need to go to really understand the distribution of ice near the poles? And so what we're doing is we're trying to target four different types of terrain um, where we think there's different distributions of ice. So at a minimum, and I mean, this makes sense in your freezer, right? The temperature's got to be cold enough to have ice. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a ground rule bottom number one. So we look at what we call ice stability depth maps. Um, which are primarily based on temperature. Um, we have measured temperatures from a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. We can then model what we expect the temperatures to be like in the subsurface. And basically you figure out if it's cold enough to hold the ice that you're interested in looking for. So we make these um, maps, um, these ice stability maps. And then for Viper, we've defined four different ice stability regions or ISRs. Um, one is where it's expected to be dry. So basically, it's just too warm. We're interested in the upper meter and it's too warm there. So ice isn't stable, so it's not gonna be there. Um, two is deep ice where you're starting to get a little bit colder. So if you go deep enough, um, you'll hit cold temperatures and you could theoretically have ice there. Three is shallow ice. Now you're getting even into colder areas and within a half a meter or so, 50 centimeters of the surface, 
um, you could have ice because it's cold enough to have it there. And then surface ice, where you would expect um, ice could be stable right on the surface. You don't even have to dig. Um, and that's typically within one of these permanently shadowed regions or these areas that don't see sunlight, which then obviously makes them very cold. So for Viper, we need to hit all four of these different types um, in order to really understand what's going on with the ice. So as I said, there has not been a, a site selection, a final site selected for Viper, but we're looking at the options just to understand the trade space. So remember, Viper is solar powered, so it needs some sun. So we need to go near sunlight. Um, but then we're also trying to go where there's ice, so we want to go near where it's dark. So you can see the, the tug and the interplay there. Go where there's sun, but also go where it's dark, um, which are not always the same. Um, but analysis have found, so there's been some really sophisticated work and really impressive analysis tools developed out at NASA Ames um, showing that you actually can find these areas where you have safe havens, where you can go where you don't have too much shadow. And so that's what these yellow boxes are showing. And they're usually on the tops of ridges, around the edges of craters, on the top of the crater rim, which makes sense because that's where you're gonna have the most sunlight for the longest period of time. Um, so if just as examples, um, here are, are three different sites that one could consider, uh, the Nobile site, Shoemaker site, and the Haworth site. Um, they have safe havens, they have you know the, the solar power needs, they're near where we think there's ice, there's different ice stability regions in each of those areas. So you're starting to get a sense of what we need from a site in order to meet the mission objectives. So there has been some work done to try and say, okay, where are these safe havens? And then can we actually have traverses that are fall within the requirements for Viper that actually work? Is there a solution that closes? So for example, here's a safe haven that's up here. Um, and so I really like this visualization because you start to sort of see, see what I'm talking about. Here's a safe haven up here on the top, right? Because you're in the sunlight. Here's the hilltop containing the safe havens, but then you also have to be near somewhere that has shadow and has expected ices. Um, but the safe haven is where you park and you're safe and you stay there. <laughs> you mostly don't move when you're out of sight from the earth. So here are some just reference traverses. These are not the traverses that Viper will, will necessarily be driving, but just as studies and examples to show that yes, this actually can work because it's a very complicated problem. So for example, you can land here, you know, out in the middle of this bullseye. These circles are about 100 meters. Um, so you just get a sense of scale. Um, and then you go to these different ice stability regions and there are different science stops, science stations within them. And you can duck into a permanently shadowed region. And we can, you know, you can see down here, these are these four ice stability regions I talked about in the different colors, surface, shallow, deep, and dry. So we need to hit all four of those. And, you know, how many times can we drill and, and how much area do we cover? And we have metrics for all of these things. And we just need to make sure that there are solutions out there that Viper can actually work and last for 90 to 100 Earth days. And it turns out you can, which is really, really awesome. So um, where are we? I'm not too far over time, so that's good. Um, where are we now? So here is the high level schedule. Um, last year, formulation through requirements lockdown, that has been done. Um, 2020 is the preliminary design re review, which has also been done. Next year will be the critical design review. These are just standard um, reviews within NASA for mission uh, for flight projects. That will happen then in 2022, system integration and test. The launch is currently scheduled for November of 2023. And then we're operating for a few months. And by uh, you know, spring of 2024, um, the mission should be concluded from its nominal um, timeframe. So, with that, I will uh, say thank you, and I would be very glad to have discussion and take questions and uh, see what y'all think. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for your outstanding presentation. Yay! Woo! All right, guys, it is, it is Q&A time, so feel free to put all of your questions in the Chat box, yes, I see Heather C, you raise your hand. You have permission to go ahead and unmute and ask the question. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Okay, this was a fantastic presentation and I really value taking time um, relatively late on the central 
time standard to present <laughs> this, but um, so my question is, how are you mitigating lunar dust on the solar cells? Yeah, there's been a lot of work on that, <clears throat> and not just the solar cells, but also the wheels. Um, there's been a lot of testing that's been done um, in um, at Ames, at other NASA centers as well, um, looking at the wheel design, you know, how much dust do you kick up? And so the, the panels are purposely on the sides, right, so that you can maximize your, you know, and we can, we can move, so you can maximize your solar power output. Um, it hasn't been shown to be a uh, show-stopping, huge limiting factor yet. There's also batteries that also, you know, provide um, power, especially for when you're in safe havens and if, you know, you're out of sun for a short duration of time. Um, and so we can characterize what we think will actually be kicked up, what will adhere, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's in the pipeline of things that are being considered. Thank you. Next question is, what makes the safe haven safe? And what is the definition of a safe haven? Yes. So a safe haven is just basically a place where we can go um, when we don't have direct communications to Earth. So our main communication when we're driving, when we're drilling, is D to E, direct to Earth. So we need to know what the rover's doing, we need to know that it's safe, we need to know where it's going. So when we don't have that direct communication, because we don't have a, we don't have a comm relay satellite or anything like that. So when we don't have that communication, we kind of stop <laughs> um, and we wait until we can see the Earth again. And so that's why we go to these safe havens and they're you know, sort of usually on, Sort of higher ground where there's more sunlight um, because we only have so many batteries. Batteries are really heavy to bring. So you only have so many batteries so you can only survive so long in darkness, right? And because we're at the polar regions, shadows come and go so quickly. And so by going, we just made this term safe haven. It's, I think it's a Viper Project made up thing, <laughs> that terminology. But it really, really works because that's exactly what it is. It's somewhere where you go, you just wait, um, you know, you, you're just waiting until you can see the earth again, until you have calm, you're keeping the rover itself safe, you're making sure that you have enough power, you're charged up enough, and then once you're a go, then you continue on your traverse. Um, so it was a, it's a unique feature of the Viper mission because we needed to last longer, last several lunar days, right? We needed to be able to go long enough so we could drive and prospect long enough to cover enough area in order to get the science data that we need to map out the ice in all these different regions. So this increases the robustness of the mission because we're able to drive longer, cover more area, cover more of these ice stability regions, pop in and out of permanently shadowed regions, get more drilling sites, basically getting more data um, by being able to extend the length of the mission just given the physical conditions of the lunar poles. Like it's really, really complicated um, how the, the topography, the interplay of the topography and the low angle of sunlight um, really influences your, your shadowing. Okay, and still speaking about the safe haven, what could be the complication to put a vertical greenhouse on the safe haven? A vertical greenhouse, like growing plants? I guess so. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be very cool. There are, there are people who are actively working on um, plant growth for on the moon. Um, that's not part of the Viper mission, but looking down, you know, looking downstream, if you want to have sustained human exploration and human presence on the moon and also looking forward to Mars, I mean, there are, there are very valid reasons for wanting to grow plants on the moon. Um, one of them is not only to prove that you can do it, but also, you know, we, we have, um, one of the most common plants that's grown is Arabidopsis, um, and it's used to understand the biological response to reduced gravity to a higher um, radiation environment. You can also start looking at lunar regolith. Can you grow things in that? Do you need to use hydroponics, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of work that's being done on like lunar plant growth modules um, to show well, what is their biological response, you know, for these representative organisms. And then also to start thinking about how can you have, you know, larger scale greenhouses, can you test it on the moon and then look at the applications to Mars. And it's also a really great opportunity for outreach and education because I could imagine, you know, you take these little seeds to the moon and you grow them in your plant growth chamber and you send those seeds to every classroom across the country and have the students grow their own plants and compare it to what's happening on the moon. So, yeah, so we're not growing plants on Viper, 
but um, there are there are folks that are working on those technologies to be able to do those types of things. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a finance question. What is the cost of the mission of the Viper mission? Oh, I think that that is in. I'm gonna have. I'm not gonna quote it because I don't want to get it wrong, and I can't remember if I had it in that spec sheet or not. So I can follow up and put that in the chat later. Okay. So. Yeah. And the second part of the question is also, do you expect the life of the mission to be extended if the rover remains functional? That is a very good question. Um, I think that is to be determined. We are planning to have our full mission success within that, you know, 90 day time frame, that time scale. So we will have accomplished everything that we need to accomplish um, within that time um, and meet all of our objectives. Um, I think it's to be determined what happens at the end. Um, you know, you could imagine a few different scenarios. You could keep on driving. <laughs> you could drive into a permanently shadow region and just drive until you die. Um, get some really interesting data. Um, so the end of life mission, um, we'll see. Okay. Um, so we have a, a comment from Paul. Isn't nuclear a better option for going into permanent shadow regions? Perhaps, but cost and schedule don't really allow us to do that. Um, so that's why we're, we're using the solar powered option. And for what we need to do with Viper, um, we have a solution and it works. Um, so we're able to be launched on clips. We're launching in, you know, not that far away. <laughs> it's actually, you know, when you think about how soon it is, like, wow, we have a lot to do before we launch. Um, so, in terms of cost, in terms of schedule, and being able to meet our objectives, um, we're able to do that with solar power. Are there, with the current Viper mission, are there any opportunities for undergrad and graduate students at this time? That is a great question. Um, and I'm really happy with our leadership on this mission because people realize, you know, that's an important component of doing this. So we are working with some institutions that have students that are doing research projects and, and working on different aspects as well. Um, there will be participating scientist programs that'll that'll be available for people to apply. Um, so we really want to get the best minds working on this and analyzing the data. And then, of course, the data um, within about six months or so is always put in the planetary data system. So it will all be publicly available so that anyone can go in and analyze that data. And we encourage people to do that. And folks can write proposals and you know get funding and have students working on this um, because it's going to be such a rich data set that it's going to take a lot of people um, a lot of time to really harvest all the information that can come out of it you know on the mission you know sort of real time quickly we'll do as much as we can but then it will be years and years and years of still analyzing that data and pulling out new information yes absolutely a definitely a collaborative effort um what kind of activities are intended in leg two in leg mm -hmm. two uh-huh oh so it's just um it's sort of similar i only went through like one but it's sort of a similar repeat we drive on rails we go to the next science station we do three drill sites in that science station and those science stations will be strategically chosen ahead of time in order to get the coverage of the isr so we need the ice stability regions so we need to go from you know dry to potentially ice on the surface so those science stations themselves are predetermined. We, we do our best to figure out what those are before we even launch. And then we do that rails driving in between those science stations so that we can, you know, hit all those areas and collect all the data. We have requirements on, you know, the amount of area we need to cover and how much prospecting to do and et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of a, a cyclical process. Okay. Um, how have lessons learned from Mars rovers influenced Viper? Yeah, that's a great question. So Mars rovers have a lot of experience you know, doing operations. So there are, you know, there are differences and similarities between Moon and Mars. Of course, you know, Mars has sent, sent a lot of rovers to Mars. The operations is, is quite different, I would say, um, because we have this real-time nature where we're getting data back in real time. Whereas for Mars, we get data back and we digest it and then we send the command up and then the spacecraft, you know, the rover does what it's supposed to do and then it radios back and tells us what it did and then we think about it and we, we go back again. But there's a lot of lessons learned, obviously, um, you know, from, you know, how you do that brings, how you analyze the data. We're looking at, you know, spectrometers, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and we're also looking at a lot of feed forward to Mars. What can we learn on the moon that also applies to Mars, especially mm -hmm. in terms of ISRU and the utility of having ice? Because we know from orbital missions, from rover missions, or I mean landed missions, um, modeling, that Mars has a lot of ice too, <laughs> actually more than the moon, right? Mars has polar caps, Mars has ice in its subsurface, Mars has water, small amounts in the atmosphere. So there's a tremendous potential for water ice ISRU on Mars as well. So I think it's a two-way street that we're learning things on the moon that will apply to Mars and we can learn from Mars to apply to the moon as well. Sure, absolutely. Do you anticipate the electrostatic ad adherence of lunar dust? And if so, what are the countermeasures? Yeah, so we have looked at that and there are folks that are looking at that. Um, the electrostatic dynamics of, you know, how that could levitate dust, how that could move dust. There's a lot of testing that's being done to characterize this. Um, I mentioned the rover wheels, um, but affecting all parts, all components of the rover itself. It's something we're very aware of. There's a lot of modeling that's being done because looking at the different electrical potentials of the lunar surface, particularly when you're near sort of terminator regions, which is where you go from light to dark, that's sort of where we expect a lot of that to be happening and we'll be experiencing that on Viper. So it's something that we have to be aware of. Um, so, so far, um, yeah, it's on the radar, um, but the systems are being designed to handle this. And uh, we have some data um, from some of the previous lunar missions, orbital and landed, um, to put some constraints on that. Okay, thank you. Why would isotopic um, composition be different than that of Earth? That is a great question. That is, we don't know what it is yet, and we would really like to know. Um, and the isotopic uh, differences or similarities, we don't know. But anyway, that can help tell us where this water came from. We don't really know where this water ice that we think we see on the moon came from. You know, did it, was it delivered from comets and or asteroids that were impacting the lunar surface, also impacting the Earth? Um, we know that comets and asteroids have water in them, so how much of that was delivered? How much of the contribution is from, you know, early in the moon's um, history, a lot of volcanic outgassing? And there's been some really interesting work coming right out of LPI, actually, about this, about volcanic outgassing and, and how much of those volatiles were released and then could make their way to the cold traps. Um, how much of it is coming, this water or, or OH signatures that we're seeing, it's coming from solar wind and solar wind implantation and the effects of the solar wind hitting the lunar regolith or the lunar dirt, so to speak. Um, and so there's multiple options for how this water got to the polar regions. We don't know the relative contributions of those. Um, and so that's why we want to try and get to these questions of how did the water get there? Um, how is it migrating across the moon now? We think it's probably moving, right? It's probably migrating. And if there's things, you know, volatiles coming from the mid latitudes and coming down to the poles. And then basically once a, a volatile or an ice particle or molecule hits a cold trap, it's pretty much stuck. Because it's mm -hmm. so cold, it just doesn't have enough energy to get out. So that's one of the things that we uh, kind of took away from the LCROSS mission, which was that impactor where we hit in this really dark, cold crater. And then it kicked up this plume of all sorts of junk, like all <laughs> sorts of different compounds. We're like, what is all this? And um, it's sort of like the, the junkyard of the solar system, like stuff gets thrown and stuck in there and it can't get out. So it's this amazing, you know, potential treasure chest showing the history of what was going on, you know, across solar system history. And it's like preserved in these permanently shadowed regions because it can't get out, it's too cold for those molecules to then escape. So there are all of these questions that are good science questions, but are also part of the applied science and part of getting to the exploration side, because we need to know, I mean, and we do this on Earth too, if you're, you know, you're looking for a resource, you wanna know how it got there, you know, what's it doing, why is it still there? So you can figure out if it's worth drilling and if it's worth, you know, setting up your mine site and going to extract it or not. So it's all, it's all sort of, tied together, the science, the exploration, and then the technology for how to actually get to it once we figure out what's there and where it is. Mm, okay. Um, Nate asks, how is it that surface frost don't sublimate in vacuum? Or uh, is he um, conceiving the term frost incorrectly? So how no, is that the- it's a very good question. It's a very good question. It was, it's been 
it's a relatively new observation. And so I think we're still wrapping our head around how these things can happen. Um, the temperatures are really cold. We're seeing some signatures from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, for example, that are, um, so that's an orbiter that's going around the moon. So that's remote sensing. So looking down from orbit, that's um, those um, measurements are indicative of, or suggestive of surface frosts. So yes, frosts, like molecules of water and, and or other volatiles. The trick is they have to be, I mean, for the surface materials, they really are mostly in shadowed regions. And whether that's a large permanently shadowed area, or now we're understanding that there are colder micro traps, like down to like this big, right? Really cold areas that are shadowed permanently just because of the complex topography. So you've got this wide range of scales and it goes back to the temperatures, it goes back to, and so we're talking about, you know, ices that are stable over geologic time. So it means the sublimation rates are there, but they're super low so that you can maintain those. So that's one of the things that we want to investigate. We want to look at these, you know, PSRs of all these different size ranges um, and see, you know, is there ice there? That's why we have these spectrometers. And this is also why Nervous is so great because it'll be able to measure the thermal environment. Like what are the temperatures and are they cold enough to keep these ices there? Um, because we have all of these really interesting, you know, theories and, uh, but we have to get on the ground and actually test it and, and measure it directly. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your thorough explanations for all the questions. We appreciate you. Um, anyone else who's participating, please continue to drop your questions in the chat box or in unmute yourself to ask them directly. Feel free. Thank you so much. You've done an awesome job so far, guys. Thank you for all the great questions. Yeah, this has been good. People paid attention. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> These are good questions. Oh, how will you navigate or see in the PSRs? Yes, that's a great question. We will have lights. There will be lighting systems on the rover. And this is actually one of, I think, one of the cooler tests that are being done. So um, at NASA Ames, we have a giant lunar regolith simulant, simulant facility with like eight tons of regolith simulant, which is basically dirt that's like moon dirt. It's not moon dirt, but it sort of is. And so you can turn the lights off and you can, you know, test different configurations of lighting on the rover system and figure out what works best and figure out what works best with the cameras that are mounted, the hazard cameras and the navigation cameras and make sure you're not getting glare and make sure you're illuminating the area that you need to see. Because yeah, it's, I mean, you're going into darkness. So there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so there's a lot of work that's being done to optimize um, that navigation system. Let there be light. All right. Exactly. <laughs> that, I mean, as scientists, we're so excited to drive into a PSR, but I can appreciate the engineers are terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have the most robust system that you can to make sure that that is safe because we want to go in and we want to come back out. What would constitute a significant quantity of ice for humans to use? Yep, that's a great question. Um, and we had that on LCROS too. That was 10 years ago. So the going in assumption was if you had on order of about 1% um, water ice by weight, then that was worth it for considering ISRU for future exploration. So the interesting thing about LCROSS is we found about five to six weight percent. So that's, you know, significantly more than the sort of bottom bare bones. Okay, if you got 1%, this is, this is worth doing. So we found much more. So this is again, one of the motivating factors for Viper. This is sort of the follow-up because LCROSS answered that, you know, very basic question, like, is there water there? And is it even remotely <laughs> in enough, enough of it to use? And the answer is an emphatic yes. So now Viper is going to the next you know, level of characterizations. Like, okay, we know that there's water ice near the pole of the moon, but now we have to characterize it a little, a little finer grain, right? We have to figure out where it is and how deep is it and what's the distribution. Um, because Elcross purposely targeted like the coldest, darkest place with the most hydrogen that we could see from orbit. Like we wanted to maximize like, is there water ice there? So go to the place where you had the best chance of finding water ice. So that worked, so that was good. And so now with Viper, we're like, okay, 
Now we're going to go and do this, you know, characterization on the surface. And we're actually going to go to places that are, you know, where you could conceive of humans actually operating. Because over 10 years, we've learned a lot. And we've gotten a lot smarter. And so now by looking at LRO, for example, diviner, the instrument is diviner, it measures temperatures. Looking at that data and then modeling the subsurface temperatures, we figured out that even in areas that get some sunlight near the poles, which is good if you're a person and you want to be able to see, like do operations, even in these areas that get sunlight for a few days or you know, a week or 10 days, whatever, during the, during the month, if you go down just a little bit, you know, a few centimeters, a few tens of centimeters, you're at those depths where it's cold enough to have ice. So this is part of what Viper's looking at. It's like, wait, so you could go to places that are in sunlight but have ice really near the surface. And so that really can change the game when you're talking about if you want to use this resource. Because if you can set up your ISRU plant somewhere where you've got light, as opposed to the deepest, darkest crater, you know, <laughs> um, in a PSR, that makes your operations a lot easier, that makes the technology development a lot easier. And so we're sort of, we're, we're getting smarter about where to look um, and where we think that ice might be. And so I think it's, it's actually turned out to be good that we're doing Viper now um, because now we have this information to help guide us and guide us as to the best places to do that ground truthing and answer those questions. Well, all right, and thank you so much. We want to make sure that we're respecting everyone's time, so we're not taking another question at this time, but we want to just thank you for being here and taking time out your busy schedule to be with us. And I want to thank every one of our particip uh, participants, whether you asked the question or not, or you've learned a little bit more about Viper. That's all that matters. Hey, guys, we are going to be announcing our next Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series um, talk. It hasn't been finalized yet, but be on the lookout for a next announcement. And we hope that you join us at that one as well. Thank you all so very much and have a wonderful evening.